welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 224, How to Revise Your Book, an interview with Jenny Nash, coming to you on Thursday, December 3rd, 2020. So were you one of the hundreds of thousands of people who are working on your novel all last month, trying to write 50,000 words in a month for National Novel Writing Month? My husband and I participated, several of my friends, let's see, I was involved in three different groups of people who are all participating and we did varying degrees of success. I think that all of us actually felt like we were successful, mostly because we knew what our internal goals are. And really you can only compete against yourself when it comes to writing. Are you writing better than you were before? Are you writing more words and not just words, like more words that are also still good <laughs> than you were before. So there's lots of sorts of ways to uh, feel it like, like you're successful. I actually spent a lot of the month plotting, and now I think my book is getting much, much better because I stopped writing, <laughs> took a breath, and started rethinking it and asking myself, is this going in the direction that you meant it to? Do you have the goal, motivation, and conflict for all the characters? Turns out, no. My hero is just as fabulous in the beginning of the book as he is in the end, which means that it won't work. <laughs> so I had to stop and go, okay, what's the problem my hero had uh, has that I am going to help him solve? <laughs> So whatever you've been doing, I hope that you feel good about yourself, not in comparison to anybody else, but just what you're doing. And if you're having one of those moments when you're like, no, actually, I, I kind of suck because I didn't really do anything. Just take a deep breath. Every day is a new chance to start over again. So if you have been writing a lot, I strongly suggest that you take a break after you get to the end. So when you finish your first draft, you'll find advice from all kinds of people this month on the show about take a break, a week, two weeks. I wouldn't go more than a month. So feel free to take the month of December off, relax, celebrate, do some things that make you feel happy. Um, but in any case, you want to give yourself a break so that you can think. Um, actually, the whole point is that you are going to try not to even think about your book. But then in the back of your mind, it all starts kind of gelling. And when you come back to it again later, you're looking at it going, oh, okay, I didn't see how I did this before. This is really good. Oh, that's not really what I meant to do over here. And it'll help you to be a lot more clear when you go through the revision process. So first step is take a break. Second step is listen to all five episodes this month because it's going to be great. All agents and editors talking about editing and um, all the pros and cons of different ways that you can do it. So between all five of the guests and actually um, one one guest is actually two people, two guests. So between all of these people, you're going to get all kinds of fabulous advice. And I think that it's going to help you to make your book much better than um than if you had no advice and you were just working in a vacuum by yourself. There's a lot of fun things to working by yourself as a writer, but sometimes we need other people and we need to talk through things with other people. And that's what I want the podcast to be helping you with. So in addition to all of that, um, there are free downloads for you. <laughs> uh, today, we are talking to Jenny Nash, who is fabulous and incredibly generous with all of her advice. She also has two handouts for you having to do with two of the tools that she talks about in the interview. So look on the show notes page so that you can get the handout for the free uh, the free handout for the stoplight method, which is one of the things that she talks about. And then also there'll be a link in the show notes uh, back to her website, um, showing you how you can get the inside outline that she also talks about. So yay, you'll start out the new year with two new tools. And I think you're going to find that they're very helpful. So remember the show notes should be uh, wherever you're listening to your podcast, you should be able to find the show notes there. You can also just go to my website right now, workshop com forward slash episodes, and then look for the episode from December 3rd, 2020, how to revise your book. And you should find links for both the, um, the handout that you can immediately download with the stoplight method and the inside outline that you can download from Jenny's site. So 
I think that is everything I needed to tell you today. I hope that you're excited. It's a great episode. In fact, I've already done a lot of the interviews and I'm super duper excited because um, I, I actually almost can't wait to get done with my first draft so I can start using some of these tools for my second draft. I think that just maybe I'll be able to write the best book ever. That's always my goal. I want every book to be the best book the best book I've ever written so far. And I hope that um, this podcast and all of these five episodes in particular help you with that goal as well. So without further ado, here's Jenny. Today's guest is Jenny Nash. Jenny is the founder and CEO of Author Accelerator, a company on a mission to raise the bar on book coaching. Author Accelerator has trained more than 50 book coaches to support writers through the entire creative process. Her own coaching clients have landed top New York agents and six-figure book deals with big five houses such as Penguin, Scribner, Simon & Schuster, and Hachette. Jenny is the author of nine books in three genres, including her most recent, Read Books All Day and Get Paid for It, The Business of Book Coaching. Learn more about being coached or becoming a coach at JennyNash.com, BookCoaches.com, and AuthorAccelerator.com. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I, I was mentioning before we started that there's going to be some people listening going, her voice sounds a little familiar and her name sounds a little familiar. You've been on lots of shows, including Mark Dawson's self-publishing formula several times, which is where I feel like I've gotten to know you. <laughs> I have. I've been doing their book lab episodes, which is where we sort of dig into somebody's book that's already up on Amazon that's not doing as well as they hope. And, and we sort of pick it apart. It's, it's great fun. I mean, not the, not the picking apart, <laughs> part, yeah. but just the you know, um, digging into well, that's what we're going to be talking about here, the things that people do wrong, and they're so close to doing so much right. And, yeah. you know, it's always just so frustrating to to watch people make mistakes that could be prevented. Yeah, yeah. And you have written several books yourself. So you understand what it's like to be on both sides. I do. And, and I think that's part of the reason why I'm a good book coach and why I got into this side of things is because I had the experience of being nurtured by an editor at a big five publishing house. And, and, you know, once you're sort of inside, at least back in the day, it was um, just an amazing experience to have somebody else really in your work with you. And that's what book coaches do is we're, we're in the creative process with someone while they're writing, while they're working it out. And it's, that's just such a supportive and nurturing experience. So that's what we're trying to provide for writers. <laughs> nice, nice. Now, why don't you, we'll start with a little bit of background just so people kind of know where you're coming from. Um, but then let's definitely just like start talking about all things editing. So tell us yeah. a little bit more about like, how'd you get started? Yeah, so I, I was, as you mentioned, I was a, a writer. I was on the path to, to having that be my whole career. And I was doing well, or, or I guess I would say well enough. Certainly the thing that all writers want, which is I, I had these big five book deals. I had an editor offering me, um, she offered me a three book deal um, oh. after a two book deal. You know, I was doing the thing. But I was, I was really stuck in the mid-list and the mid-list is a kind of purgatory <laughs> and it, it's, um, you know, it's where everybody wants to get. I mean, you want to be in that position where you're writing books and you, you know, you're having publishers interested in bringing them out, but you don't make very much money. They often don't put a lot of marketing power behind you because they're doing that for the debut authors or for the big top of the list authors. So it's kind of a rough, a rough place to be. And, and I was struggling a bit uh, in that space when at the same time I was teaching at UCLA in the writer's program. And that program is one of the largest adult education writing programs in the country. It's, it's wow. huge. And part of the reason for that is because of the TV, there's screenplay and um, uh, sitcom writing and, you know, all of that going on as well. But, but I was on the, the, book writing side and I was I was teaching there and and what happened was I have a very strategic way of approaching writing rather than a craft-based way I, I teach craft obviously but I really am thinking about 
how books are shaped and structured, how they're going to fit in the marketplace, how somebody's going to really get to that place um, of selling their book. And so I had a reputation for having that kind of a mindset. And one of my colleagues approached me and asked if I would be interested in helping her write a book from zero. She had an idea. She had, she wasn't a writer her own self and she was a story analyst and she wanted help just with the process. And, yeah. and I said, well, I've never done that before, but, but I'd love to do that. That's, that's what I think writers need. Cause a lot of times in these workshops that people take, they don't get what they need. And from the instructor's point of view, it's terribly frustrating from the writer's point of view, it's equally frustrating. You know, they're pressing their pages into the teacher's hands and, <laughs> And the teachers got whatever, 10, 15, 25 students. And there's just no way that you can read it, you know, in the way that they want to be read. They want someone in it with them. So it was a very frustrating situation. So the idea of helping somebody in the way that I thought could really impact them was exciting. So we embarked on that and I was creating processes and systems for for helping her as we went and that um person and that book was Lisa Cron who I know you're going oh. to, you're going to have on your show I um, didn't realize she was your very first friend that you helped oh yes she God. was she got a two book deal and and her books wired for story and story genius have just become classics and yeah, she has yeah. become you know incredibly um beloved in the writing world and um, such a popular speaker and presenter. And um, so that was, that was amazing. And, and then my second client got a deal for a memoir at um, Scribner. And after that, I was just, I had people lined up at my door to work with me. And I, um, I was book coaching. I sort of invented this thing. I'm not saying I invented book coaching. It just, for me, like I, it invented, yeah, in your yeah, own life. I, yeah. It just sort of happened. And I, and I began to realize that I was better at book coaching than I was at writing. I was finding more success as, at it than I was at writing. And I enjoyed it just as much helping other people's dreams come to life and bringing their, their books into the world. And so that's, that's kind of where book coaching happened for me. And then I, um, I started a book coach training company. So yeah. that's uh, what author accelerator is. Wow. So the book coaching and teaching at UCLA extension, they, they probably sound kind of similar until you really start thinking about it. And then they, my guess is they're not actually that similar, um, teaching not at all similar. versus yeah. So the way that we tend to teach writing is, is, in this piecemeal sort of way. So, you know, you might take a class, um, you know, there's a lot of courses for people, for example, who are coming back to writing after not doing it for a long time. You know, maybe they did it when they were younger or in college or they always wanted to write and now they're older and they want to do this thing. And we've seen that a, a lot in the pandemic is people coming back to a thing that they always wanted to do and that is meaningful to them. And they don't want to, get to the end of their life and say, well, I never tried this or I never, I never gave it a real shot. So, you know, you've got people doing that and that, that kind of writing can be taught well in, in a course, because it's that sort of situation is I, I just want permission to write. I want to get back in the habit of it. I want to find my voice and get my feet under me. I want to be in a community of other writers that's, that's a fabulous way um, for somebody to, to take a course and do that. Then we have a whole situation of people who are further along in the process and they're trying to get read. So now they've moved from, I want to do this because it's a cool thing or I'm interested in it or it feels good or that sort of thing. And there's, now there's this whole group who want to want to be read. And those are the people who are taking the craft class and you know how do I write better dialogue how do I write a better scene how do I develop characters better how do I revise um and and those are also the folks going to writing conferences so those tend to be 
very uh, pitch focused. How do I get an agent? How do I, uh, what should be on my website? You know, how do I do social media marketing? That sort of thing. So also very tactical um, mm -hmm. tactics for, for what to do. And nowhere was there a place where a writer could be nurtured that where they could help their, you know, what's my idea? What is really the best shape of to hold, contain this idea, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, what else is being written out there um, on this topic? Where do I fit into the publishing universe? How should I publish? There's so many different ways to publish. Yeah. Um, should I think of this as a money-making thing? Should I think of this as a hobby? All of those questions are can't be answered in a four-day course or a two-week course or a 10-week course. They just can't. And, yeah. and having somebody really... Um, with you word by word in the, through the process is um, just doesn't exist. So the book coaching is very different from teaching in a classroom and it's very different from traditional editing, which is when somebody finishes, a writer finishes a work and then an editor comes in and approaches that thing as a finished piece. And a developmental editor is going to look to make it better and they're going to look to come in to help that writer do a solid revision but they're they're typically not going to then see it through with them or help them to execute right. yeah because for the most part is this true that um just the people that i've met um most people are not equally good and sell their services well uh, as a developmental editor a line editor and then you know final uh, proofreading and that sort of thing. I mean, hardly anybody is going to do all three of those things for your book, right? Yeah, they're very, very different skills. They're, they're really different skills. And, um, you know, that brings up a good question for a writer, which is what, what do I need? And a lot yeah. of people seek the wrong sort of help. Um, so let's say that you have just finished NaNoWriMo because we're, we're talking now, right? As that's happening, um, and you've got this draft, this finished draft, and you, um, the mistake that somebody might make would be, I've got this draft, I'm so good, I'm going to go hire um, an, an editor, copy editor, line editor, um, what have you, and, and then that, they're not going to get what they need, they're going to get somebody who comes in and just cleans up their lines, or, you know, makes the sentences better, and, um, that's not, that's not what that book needs. And then that's going to also change the mindset of the writer where they're going to think, Oh, I'm done. I have this polished finished thing. Yeah. Okay. So what if there are different kinds of people who look at their first draft differently? Um, one person thinks my first draft, I've edited it so many times as I was writing that uh, it feels like pretty done to me. I wouldn't know what else to do versus other people. They're like, well, I was told just vomit out your first draft and, and then I'll figure it out. And the reason why I mentioned this is because Susan Elizabeth Phillips and Jane Ann Krentz are uh, two romance writers that I've heard talk at the Romance Writers of America conference so many times. And they always have this full room because they tell these funny, funny stories about how on the one hand, they're best friends. And on the other hand, they're so totally different, including that Susan feels like by the time she gets to the end of her first draft, it's almost her final draft. And Jane Ann was like, not at all for me. Keeping in mind, both of them been writing for decades in our multi New York Times bestsellers, which is not the same as Sally, who was like, I'm finally going to write my first book. So how do people figure out where am I on this spectrum? I think, yeah, this is, this is an excellent, excellent question. And there's two things that come up for me in it. The first thing is exactly what you said. One of the biggest dangers for anybody who's trying to become a writer is looking to famous people or well-known people or successful people and doing what they do because somebody who's written a number of books or who has, you know, their process or their habits or their systems dialed in, who understands the business and the industry, they, they are going to be able to take shortcuts. They're going to be able to, they've honed 
ways of doing things and you can't really just leap into what they do and say, oh, I'm like, I'm like her, my finished draft is, I edit while I go too. There's, there's one of the, so, so I know I said there were two things and I'm still on the first thing, <laughs> yeah. but the, the thing about famous writers and not doing what they do. So there are, there are writers who are what I call native geniuses. They just know how to do all this stuff. It's innate to them and they, they organically do it and they do it well. And, and this stuff means all of the levels of writing a novel. It's a very complex intellectual undertaking. And there are, just because you can tell a good story or you're a good writer or you're a good reader doesn't mean that you know how to do it. And so there's this false belief that we, we can. And I'm here to tell you, if you are not already a best-selling author, you probably don't have this native <laughs> genius, right? <laughs> yeah. Like if you're wondering about it, if you're thinking about it, most of the regular folk, and I am among them, we have to learn these skills. We have to hone these skills. We have to practice these skills. So that's the first thing I would say is, yes, take inspiration from people who are out there doing it well and, and take bits that you can learn from. But this leads me to my second point, which is that I believe the most difficult skill in all of writing, really bar none, is getting out of your own writer's head and looking at your work with a different eyes or a different perspective or a different viewpoint. Um, I know Lisa Cron in, in Wired for Story will say it's biologically impossible. You can't get out of your own head. And so that, but you can hone the skill a little, a little. So what I mean by that is when you're finished with the draft, whether you think it, you just vomited all over the page or you think, well, I edit it as I go. And so it's really careful. And I was really careful. And my draft is really more like a fourth draft or a fifth draft, fifth draft it doesn't matter what, how you get to that place. When you get to that place of having a finished draft, there, there is a moment where you have to stop looking at it like a writer. That is, so that is the, the key to all revision. And, and, it, and it comes from that idea that the most difficult thing to do is to get out of your own head. So there, there's a moment where you say, I am now going to approach this work with a different mindset. And there, there are three steps to revision, overarching steps to revising anything. And those three steps are, you analyze and evaluate what you already have. You decide how to fix the problems and then you execute those fixes. So I wanna go through that again, because what most people do when they don't take off their writer's hat, they don't draw this line in the sand and say, now I am looking at it as an editor or a reader or, you know, not the person who wrote it. Yeah. That if you don't do this, what people tend to do is they glom the three steps together of revision and they, mm -hmm. they kind of then have this mushy process of revising. And what happens really a hundred percent of the time, <laughs> if they haven't consciously separated out these steps is they fall into the same habits and patterns that they approached it as a writer. So all of a sudden they're going through the manuscript the same way you write, which is totally linear front to back, start at the beginning, turn the page, just like you read line by line. And what happens is you fall into the writer's thing of cleaning up the words and cleaning up the sentences. And Ooh, there's a better way to say that because that's fun and it's like that's what we're totally set up to do that's what we've done for however long it took us to write that manuscript and so the the danger then is you don't do these three steps you just fall into to doing seeing it with your writer's eyes so the the entire point of revision no matter what system or method you use and and there's many of them um, no matter how you approach it, whether you do it as an intensive sprint or a long haul practice or, you know, whatever, however you ex execute your revision, you've got to do these three steps. And so I'll go over them again. It's analyze and evaluate what you have, what's actually there. And that's different from what you think is there. Yeah. It's, it's right. So getting out of your writer's head is getting 
setting aside the the beautiful story that's in your head, setting aside your imagination, your what if, your your spinning of the world muscle, and really looking at what is there and analyzing and evaluate, evaluating what is there, then deciding how to fix it. So separating out that process is so powerful. There's a fabulous book that I recommend by Rachel Aaron called I believe 2000 to 10,000. It's the number. Yes. Yes. You know that or I think it might be 2k to 10k. Oh, you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a fabulous book and and she what she is doing is just analyzing her own um, production, rate of production as a writer and how she improved it and went from 2k to 10k for a given writing session, which is which is really a big leap. And yeah. And the, and her, her, um, message, her outcome of that experiment was separate out, figuring out what you're going to write from actually writing it. Don't figure out what you're going to write while you write it. So the middle step of revision is solve your problem before you go to write it, because it's very, very, very difficult to solve most revision problems while you're writing. You're going to you're not going to look at the work holistically. You're going to look at it. It's too easy to fall into that writer's path, that writer's mindset. So if you solve the problem, then you execute the fix. Then you go and you do the writing. So by the time you actually get to the writing, you've been through these two other steps, which you didn't do as a writer. And you're going to approach it in that very different way. Um, so there's many, many things that, that I want to say about this the second bit. Um, so the first, the first bit was, um, don't assume that you can do what, what the famous people do. I I would say if you are not yet published, don't tell yourself that your draft is awesome and ready to go. I think odds are just really good that it's not. And that's not because you're not a good writer. It's not because you haven't done it, done a good job. It's just very, very, very hard to, to pull it off in one go, you yeah. know, even if you're, if you're looking at it while, while you go, you may have beautiful lines. That is true. You may, the writing may be beautiful and that, that could be very true, but the story is what we're trying to get at here. So that was one. And then two is draw a line in the sand and, and do the work of revision, which is different from the work of, of writing. So the things I want to say from that are, this is a moment when it can really be enormously helpful to bring in another pair of eyes. So to do the analysis and the evaluation and to perhaps help you solve the problems at a developmental editor, a book coach, a writing group, a trusted critique partner, you know, somebody who you can really trust to be honest and to be evaluative, evaluative, is that a word? (laughs) Something like that, yeah. (laughs) To evaluate the work. And by that, I mean to give evidence about what they're saying. This is not a time for opinions or I really liked it or gee, I think you should turn this um, romance into a mystery or you should really set it in 1800s Denmark, you know. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for someone who can analyze and evaluate and has the, the training or the temperament to, to do that. So yeah. you know, people often ask me, what's the best time to hire a book coach or an editor or to get an outside help of any kind? And I always say, if you can do nothing else, get help at the very beginning of the process so that you set up your book for success. Yeah. Um, but the next most powerful step would be at this stage when you're going to analyze and evaluate a revision. So that that's one thing I wanted to say about this, this process. And then the next thing I wanted to say is that um, there are tools and methods and practices that you can use to help you work through these three steps of, of revision. And Those are um, things that you can find in a lot of different people's um, systems and methods and and such. So, um, but if you remember those three steps, you can go and choose the tools that work for you and, and, you know, or the method or the practice or whatever you want to call it um, 
to, to move through those. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, um, I'm thinking about the fact that when I went through, I, I actually haven't gotten all the way through 2k to 10k because I'll get to a point, try something that I'm so thrilled with the results that I forget. I, I still haven't been actually finished the book, but the difference in my writing, um, not just that the, um, not just that like, the difference between, I don't really know what this uh, scene's about, but I think it's about this. So I'm going to kind of type this and uh, yeah, that was kind of what I meant. Um, but it's like that versus I know exactly, like I've seen it in my mind already. I have visualized it. I know exactly what I'm going to say. And not only is the, the plot, you know, more, um, I don't know, like exacting and specific, like it's much more what I saw in my head, but the characters are more alive. And even somehow the words end up being better words put together in better ways. And it's just like, this is like magic. <laughs> so it's very yeah. interesting to me that you could do the same thing in revision. Oh, you have to, you have to. And it, um, so I have a, a, a couple really simple tools that I use to help people to, to help people with these steps, which I can explain and then I can also share some links for your listeners to, to get some PDFs um, and downloads on them. But the Great. first, um, well, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the second tool first okay. because it's easier, but there's a way that I teach people to evaluate their manuscript. And it, the, the reason that I do it this way is the entire point is to get you out of the chronological thinking. You really don't want to think about your, your story from beginning to end. You don't want to move it through it that way. You want to look at it as like the 30,000 foot view, the, the, you know, really the overview of the whole thing. And so the method that I teach is called the stoplight method, which is super easy to remember and obvious. And what you're trying to do is locate what are the red light issues in this, in this book. And those are the issues that are deal breakers. They're going to ruin the story. There are giant plot holes. There are giant um, character issues. There, there are logic problems. Maybe the story starts in the wrong place. Maybe it's in the wrong POV. So red light issues are like, rah, 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 and, and then um, and then you go down the line. And green light issues are the issues that most people actually focus on when they think they're doing revision. So that's, I'm gonna pick a better word. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a comma instead of a semicolon. It's copy editing. And the way that I teach revision is do not touch the green level issues when you're doing your analysis and evaluation and problem solving, just don't do it. And and don't even look at the yellow light issues until you've got the red light issues fixed because it makes no sense. Yeah. And so, so the idea is find the things that are going to kill this story and, and figure out how to fix them and then execute those fixes before you, you go down to that next level of the, the yellow light issues and the, the yellow light issues. So the other way that I characterize these stoplight method is by how long it's going to take you to figure it out and fix it. So a green light issue is going to take you three seconds um, or, or a minute, <laughs> right? Um, and a yellow light issue is probably going to take a couple hours to figure out. Maybe you're moving a scene. Maybe you're giving someone a new occupation, um, even changing their name, um, you know, the, something that's going to it's going to take a little effort and a little time. You're going to have to set aside a chunk of time to figure it out and to fix it. Yeah. And a red light issue is going to take you a couple days. It's at least it's a big issue. And those are the things we want to look at first. So when you, when you force yourself to look at a manuscript in this way, now what you're doing is, again, you're looking at it as a whole entity. You're looking at it holistically. You're not looking at it the way that you did as a, a writer. And this is the way that agents and editors read. You know, people um, sometimes wonder, 
And I'm the same way. I read so many manuscripts and I evaluate so many manuscripts that I can do it extremely quickly. And, and people don't believe it. And they don't believe that about agents. How can they, how can they tell in you know, five pages that this is good or not good? How can they, how can they evaluate a manuscript in, in an hour you know, if they're trying to determine whether to represent it? And the answer is that we look for patterns because there are, there are patterns that all writers tend to get wrong. And ten, you tend to see over and over and over again. And basically what you're doing when you're doing a fast evaluation is, do I see any of these problems? And you can very quickly identify them if you're trained to identify them. So it's not, it's really not rocket science when you learn how to look at a manuscript in that way. It's yeah. It's just here the likely things that that writers get wrong and the likely things that writers don't see in their own work because of just the nature of the way that it is. So yeah. so that's the that's the first sort of um, how to that I would share with people is is when you're doing your analysis and evaluation, think think like that. And yeah. you can do this. Um, evaluation chapter by chapter, you can take a chapter and read it and say, are there any yellow or red light issues here? Is there anything that that's a red flag basically? Yeah. Then go to the next chapter and figure that out. And then you're gonna start to also see threads that, that become problematic. Um, so again, when I say not, it's not chronological, be, when, you, when you go to fix it, when you go to fix the problem, you're not going to go chapter by chapter by chapter. You're probably going to go, a red light issue is probably going to be, make itself visible in chapter one, three, five, 16, 27, and 34. So, so now it's more like weaving. You're, I talk about the, the idea of a golden thread. You're, you're weaving this thread through and maybe you're unweaving a thread through. And what you've got to do is look where it pings back and forth in the whole of the manuscript where you're, you know, I just, I just helped a client um, do this exact analysis on a 400 plus page um, manuscript set in the years just before, um, just before Pearl Harbor. And um, just this epic historical uh, thing. And and she had, um, it's, a, it's a novel set in the world of music in the, um, there's a cello player who is the protagonist. And she had some problems with um, timing with when certain um, music was performed and with this progression of this person's career from a music point of view. Mm -hmm. So she actually brought in um, a musical scholar who happened to be my sister. <laughs> Is that? <laughs> my sister is in fact a professor of music theory and and a musical history scholar so wow. um, we brought her in to analyze just the music right that it we're not looking for this musical scholar to to analyze the story that's not their area of expertise and yeah. that's that's that careful who are you going to go to and what are you going to ask them question so we, we got this analysis of the music that actually brought up a number of really um, big issues, which were um, the author had, had used some historical figures in her fictional work and, and then didn't stick, didn't adhere to the real history. Oh. So she had to make a decision to, to do one or the other, right? Yeah. To fictionalize it or to adopt a real person and follow their real trajectory. Then there was another really interesting issue that had come up. There were some key plot points that hinged on the main character knowing very well certain pieces of music. And my sister had pointed out if she grew up in America, in New York, in this year, in this whatever, she would not have had access to the recordings of this or that, or right. she only would have been able to hear it um, on the radio or in a record store. And so then there were these, it sort of caused us to have to really think through those plot elements. Right. So 
they, it seems like a small thing, but those actually turn out to be red light issues. And how are they going to play through the entire manuscript, right? Where right. The, this protagonist's relationship to her own music and to her own career and to her own ambition, that's really what these things were playing into. So we had to do, so, to solve the problem, we had to really think through, okay, wait, we've got to go back and think about who this person was before she came to Germany. What did she know? What was she doing? Where did she live? Did she have access to the things that the writer had assumed she would have access to? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing by, by, that I mean by analyze and evaluate, decide how to fix the problem, then go fix the problem. And so that was a red light issue that pinged through this 400 page manuscript. And so that's the work that we were doing. Okay. So here's a question. Um, I, I thought I heard you say, start by reading chapter one, make your notes on what you think are the red, yellow, and green light issues, and then keep reading. So you're not saying you're, you're not saying, I think, um, edit chapter one and then move on. Cause I was like, how would you know what the overarching uh, issues were until you've finished well, reading the whole book? <laughs> Kitty, you just gave me a super softball pitch to the awesome. second, the second <laughs> tool that I wanted to talk about. I did that um, on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, it was a perfect question. Um, the, and it was actually the first tool, but I talked about the, the stoplight method first, because you'll see why. So the the tool that I have designed to, to help with the analysis and evaluation and problem solving is a tool I call the inside outline. And it is a tool that you can use before you start writing a book. That's actually why I made it and how I teach it and how I use it. But wow. what happened is it becomes so terribly effective for revision that I, I teach it for revision now. And um, I know we, we have met around Mark Dawson's self-publishing courses and universe. And right. um, I've just launched a course on how to revise a novel at um, self-publishing formula. And the inside outline is a core part of that course. And it's been really fun to see people. There's a Facebook group attached to that course and everyone's in there sharing their inside outlines and taking pictures of them because what you can do is you can actually put your red, yellow, and green um, issues on this document. And um, so here's the thing that's mind blowing. If you do it right, and there are very strict rules, <laughs> um, you're, well, there's two, there's two ways to do it in revision, but if you do it right, an inside outline is only three pages long. So that's why wow. it's beautiful, right? It's a powerful, powerful little tool. So all it is, is this, I say all it is, but it's, kind <laughs> of, it's, it's easy to, um, easy to understand and hard to do, but revision is hard. And it's just like the 2k to 10k book where you, you do a few you separate out a few tasks in order to make the overall task easier. That's, that's what the inside outline does. It takes the really hard work of either starting to write or starting to revise and kind of concentrating it in, in one small place. So it's a small, simple tool, but it, it's hard to get it right. So what the inside outline is, is an analysis and evaluation tool. And all you're doing is you're taking the what I call the tent pole scenes of your story, the ones that hold it up. If you were to graph it out, it's the highs and lows. So it's not at first going to be every scene. Oh my goodness, that is not <laughs> something that we want. Um, sorry about that. No um, worries. So you, you can graph out the highs and lows of your story. And those are the scenes you want to put in the inside outline at first. And, and, you want to see the shape of the story. You want to see how it's moving through time. You want that 30,000 foot view. And, and this is what gives it to you. And it's, it's called an inside outline because each plot point is paired with an interior point. So the outside is the plot and the inside is the protagonist's emotional response to the plot. So it's right. how they're making meaning of the plot what the point of that scene is, why is it even here? Why do we care? Does it, does it play into the story? 
So that's what's hard. It's super easy to put the plot points down on a page and just you just slug them out. They're just bullet points. Here it is. Yeah. And the hard part is pairing every single plot point with an interior point. But what you can do when you do that, it's like an architect making a mini model of a house and being able to hold it up in 3D and walk around and look at it and see where it's holding together and where it's not. And if you do the inside outline well, you can absolutely spot the red, yellow issues on, on your whole story. And you, so the other day I did a live uh, coaching of a student from the self-publishing formula class. And so people submitted their inside outlines and I made them do three page versions. And I'll talk about a longer version in a minute. And I selected one to teach from because it was so good. <laughs> and, and it was, it was a thriller. So it was like this super complex action packed thriller. And the reason I picked a thriller is because everyone always says, Oh, that's not for my, what I write, you know, what I write doesn't have the emotional, whatever. It's like, yes, it does. I promise. And if it's good, it does. And this yeah. one was so good. It had a female prota protagonist and a kind of classic thriller. There was some high tech, you know, shenanigans going on. It was fabulous. It's fabulous story. And she had the, the points paired to her plots in a way that was, um, powerful and and you could see the arc of change in the character in three pages you could wow. see how the whole thing moved and went and but there were two things that were instantly obvious to me and those are the patterns I was talking about the what the inside outline does is allow you to see those patterns or those holes and she had this totally bizarre out of nowhere POV shift in the last three chapters and it was like we were close third point of view all the way through this story in this woman protagonist point of view. And then all of a sudden at the critical everything solved um, moments, it was in somebody else's point of view. And it was like, so I, I asked her, was that intentional? Because sometimes it might be, there might be a good story reason for that. Yeah. And, and she had not even known that she had done that. Oh, wow. And, and she had the idea that she was setting up the next book was going to be in the POV of the person who took over this story. So she, she sort of kind of had this conscious reason for doing it, but she had not really identified that, that she had done that on purpose. So that was a super easy fix to solve. And then um, the other thing was that she had left out some of the most powerful elements of this character's internal story and her arc of change and why any of this mattered to her. And it was there. It was in the beginning. It was described. It was there. It was built up, but then she dropped it. And it was not, it was not locked in to the, to the every single scene needs to move that character story forward, needs to move that arc of change forward. Yeah. So um I said to her, if you go back and you really consciously trace that arc of change through these scenes and lock that into every single scene, you're now going to have, when you go back to your revision, um, you're going to know exactly what that scene needs to do. And, and it's not just the plot. It's never just the plot. Yeah. That scene needs to do something with that character. And the inside outline becomes a map, a roadmap for, so it's, it, it's um, an analyzing and, and evaluating and solving the problem. And then yeah. when you go to execute the fix, you have this roadmap. And so it um, sounds like you're saying that um, this person could have written this outline before ever writing chapter one of the book or they could have used this outline after they finished the first draft to figure out what needed to be done in the revision? That's correct. And if the world were perfect, every single writer would do an inside outline before they start. But the world is not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I am not that famous. And, <laughs> and I also have a hard time convincing people how powerful it is. People, writers want to write. They want to write. They're yeah. racehorses out of the gate. They've got their idea. They can see their story and they want to just go. And there's such a hesitancy to stop and pull out the 
the work of figuring it out before you write it. And it's like, okay, that's fine. You know, that's fine. That's what you're going to do. You should do it and like do what you're going to do and, yep. and write your draft. But for people just coming off of nano, that's, that's all you can really do yeah. when you're writing at that rate of speed. So fine, do it. But then cross that line in the sand and say, now for the moment I am finished being a writer, I am going to now be an analyst and an evaluator and, and an editor. And I'm going to see what do I have here? Yeah. So this is where you can use the inside outline in a slightly different way, which is you can make an inside outline that reflects exactly what you have on the page. So in this scenario, you can make it eight or nine pages long. When I'm teaching people that how to use the tool before they start to write, or teaching them how to use it at revision. I insist on the two to three pages because if you can't get the basic overall shape right, you're never gonna be able to do it at eight or nine pages long. You have yeah. to be able to get your story right in a concentrated way and to see how this works. But once you can do that, expand it out, make it eight or nine pages, make it reflect exactly what you have on the page and then here's the beauty of this. You can do your analysis and evaluation and your stoplight method on the inside outline. You can move things around. You can make notations. You can put those golden threads on like with the music um, novel that I was talking about, this yeah. writer had the most magnificent document. It was about, uh, I mean, she had a 400 page novel. So her inside outline that reflected the finished manuscript was about 12 pages long. I, I hesitate to let anybody go that long because it's harder to manipulate. You wanna be able to manipulate this. You wanna be able to hold it in your hands like that architectural model. But she had this 12 page thing and she was able to trace that music issue. She color coded it. It's like, here's the music issue, it's green. It's like ping, 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 ping right there, you can see it. You can see how it flows and moves and grows and changes over time. Then she had another issue that was colored, another color. She had about four kind of color coding things that she was doing. And we were solving the problems of the revision on the inside outline rather than on the 400 page manuscript. Nice. And so she had little sub points. That's why it grew so long, little sub points mm -hmm. When I go back to work on this chapter, I need to do X, I need to do Y, I need to do Z. You know, this scene needs to function in this way. And so I need to make sure to add this idea. So all of the fixes was contained in this thing. And then, and then she had to go and, um, and, and just execute. So then you're putting your writer's hat back on. Yeah. But you've got this roadmap. So right. it's super fun. And, and I, um, I have walked people through this many, many times. It's extremely effective. But as I said at the top of the show, there, there are other methods. There are great methods. And, and I say to anybody, find the method that works for you or maybe make yeah. up your own taking pieces of everybody's method. But, but regardless, do those three steps. Evaluate and analyze figure out the problem, then execute the fix. That's going to make your revision a true revision and not just polishing up the words on the page. Right. But, but choose a tool for each of the, the two first, first steps and, you know, or choose some sort of intentional way to approach that because yeah. otherwise, like I said, you're going to fall back into um, doing what a writer does, which is line by line. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, um, I don't want to throw you off track because I don't know if you have uh, a, a few more things that you wanted to, to mention. Oh, I'm so done. I've been up on my soapbox. I'm, oh. I can get off now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say this is awesome. I, I always love talking to other writers and, and talking to somebody who's like excellent at editing. I'm like, oh, I'm sure just talking to you is going to help me to become a better editor of my work as well. <laughs> but um, I'm thinking that probably a lot of the things that you deal with with because I'm, I'm thinking about people listening and um, and they they see this as a lot of work or maybe they see it as exciting and either way they're looking at it through uh, a mindset 
that they have in their mind right now. This is how I think I'm going to feel about this. So how does mindset come into play when you're working with writers? Oh, I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's everything. (laughs) Um, I think it's everything. I, I happen to deeply love revision. I think it's where stories get really good. I think it's where the fun stuff happens. I, you know, when you're writing from scratch, from zero, um, there's a great quote by Susan Bell, who wrote a book called The Artful Edit. And she said, you write into a black hole but you edit into a universe. So, you know, there's something really powerful about that. So people dread it. And, and I know this, the reason people dread it is because they don't have a method for dealing with it. And as I said, it's a complex intellectual undertaking. It's very, there are many, many, many moving parts and skills that you have to master in order to write well and revision forces you to see that. I think when you're writing, you it's kind of easy not to see that. You're just in the yeah. world and you're spinning it and you're doing it. But but so people know, they know. That's why they dread revision because they're like, this is really hard and I don't have any tools or methods for approaching this. I don't even, I've never even, you know, it's very hard and I've tried um, to to teach a course on revision like a, at a writing institution because people are, are dealing with these 400 page things so it's, yeah. you know so it's really hard which is why I develop tools and methods to to teach people because I mean so my point is you can't really go take a revision course like I've got my no- novel I'm going to take it to a course all you can do is learn some tools and methods to to apply to it but once you do that I think you will not be so afraid and you know, the other thing about mindset at this point is that I find that the closer people get to being finished, the more freaked out they tend to get. And, and that mm-hmm. freak out looks, looks usually like two different things. One is um, total procrastination in the guise of perfectionism. Like Um, I will go over this manuscript 437 more times before I let it go into the world (laughs) or before I show it to anyone else. You know, they, they hold it so close to their chest and they just refuse to um, call it a day because they know that if they do that, they're going to be judged. The world is going to judge it. And that is true. So, you know, there's that procrastination by perfectionism. And then the other thing that the freak out looks like is, um, and I see this so many times that I, that I, I should coin a term for it, but, (laughs) um, people come up on the end and that might be finishing the manuscript or it might be, um, polishing or or what have you. And they suddenly have a great idea for a new book, right? Right. (laughs) Right? It's going to be, wait, I'm going to put this one aside and do this whole other thing, or I have an idea for a series, or I have an idea for this. It happens so frequently that, and it's, I think it's great. Like creativity begets creativity, have your idea, but finish your book first. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) When my clients do that, I'm like, "Ah, no, no, stop. No. Or I, or another version of it is for nonfiction writers. I'm going to write an article. I'm going to pitch an article to the New York times or the Atlantic or whatever, which is like a whole giant undertaking in and of itself. So it's like, no, you can't do that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 So, you know, I think it's understanding what the, the mindset um, at revision tends to really all circle around fear and, you know, it's a scary thing. And I think feeling what you feel and acknowledging what you feel and understanding that you're feeling it because it matters to you will help to approach revision in a way that's lighter and more fun and um, has a time limit on it where you're not yeah. going to be doing this for the rest of your life. There is, yeah. you know, you're going to be finished and, and then you'll put it out in the world and it might be judged, but that's okay. That's part, that's part of the creative process. Yeah. Yeah. And I tried to, um, 
I try to help friends and clients and, and, you know, fellow writer friends. Well, all of us have a place. Uh, a lot of times um, the middle is one place and almost at the end is one place where all of a sudden it just seems like the world is falling apart. And you have to just remember that you need somebody to say, don't worry. Remember, you always feel this way at this point. This is just yeah. a normal part of the process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or what, what also happens if people are doing this evaluation process and they find a bunch of red light issues, most people find somewhere in the neighborhood of three to seven uh, red light issues. So let's say somebody finds seven red light issues on their, on their manuscript. They tend to just throw up their hands and say, well, that was a waste of time and I'm a terrible writer and I knew this was a bad idea and I couldn't really do it. And you know, it's like, no, actually this is so fixable. I can see that if you fix this, this, and this, you know, and I always tell them, I try to give them some percentage. That's a guess, but I'll say, I think you're actually 80% of the way where you need to be. And you just need to fix these 20% red light issues and you'll be good. Like, let's look at all the things that are good here. Right. So, you know, I think there's a tendency at revision to over dramatic, no, yeah. Over dramatize yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what's wrong. And because you want to focus on what's wrong, that's what the work is. But then right. the, to over dramatize how dire the situation is, it's usually not that dire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so for people who are thinking, well, actually I am more of a plotter. So maybe what if, um, I'm, taking a guess here. So this is a question. Um, here's the level that I'm at when I uh, write my first story and edit it, uh, not knowing anything and not really having that many tools. And this is the level my book is at. Um, then if I write my story, you know, just get it all out there on the page, but now I've got some tools, I can bring my book up to this level, but I'm guessing, and this is a question. If I start with the inside outline, and end with the inside outline, I might bring my book up to a whole new level. Totally. Totally. That's awesome. Yeah, totally. I mean, I have no doubt I've seen it a million times. And when I, um, I was working with, um, KJ Delantonia, who is, was a New York times editor and a nonfiction book writer who turned to fiction. And I helped her with her first novel, which is coming out uh, in two weeks from when we're speaking, um, oh. it's called the chicken sisters and she got a big, a big deal for it. And, um, I, I don't want to talk about the process of that book cause it was a little complicated, but for her second novel, she, she's a huge inside outline fan. So she came to me and said, all right, let's do the inside outline for the next book. And we did that. And she had a self-imposed deadline, um, a very tight self-imposed deadline for finishing the second book. Um, so we worked on the inside outline. Well, we worked on it probably for eight weeks. And this was a four page document. And we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. We had this Google doc and it was epic. And it was, she was working out the whole story and she would, she would get it really solid. And then she'd be like, nope, the ending is not right. And then she'd get it really solid. And she'd say, you know what, this whole character focus is not right. And she'd, but think about how powerful it is to do that on four pages rather than the whole thing. So then yeah. what was just mind blowing to me was she got to a place where she liked it and she kicked out that book so fast. It was, it was like, don't blink. It's gonna be done it was wow. I'm probably gonna get the timing wrong but I'm gonna say it was four months it was wow. so fast and it was and in and she sold it it was it was an amazing she did an amazing job and Man. it's gonna be a great book the chicken sisters is a great book it's a amazing fun caper really good but but just that story is illustrating if you are willing to put in the time to do that process before you start to write, you can really make the writing process both faster, but the reason it's faster is because it's more efficient and it's doing exactly what Rachel Aaron suggests, which is separate out the figuring out from the actual writing. Yeah. Uh, so I like to believe that that process absolutely can, can make you a better writer, but 
that's just because it's my process and I like it. But what actually makes you a better writer is being intentional about what you are not doing well and finding some sort of method or tool to help you do that better. Yeah. You know, trying to do all the things all by yourself all the time. Why would you think you can learn this complex thing that you've never done before? Why do we think we can do that with writing books when we don't think we can do that with so many other things? Right. So it's when, so this takes us back to your question about mindset. I think um, the most powerful mindset a writer can have in general is a growth mindset. And I think that's true also for someone like me who is an entrepreneur. It's, it's that constant, what do I not know? How can I do better? What, what's working? What's not working? How can I look at this in a different way? Who can I to turn to for help? That constant um, iterative process of, of improving. And if a writer has that mindset, they're probably not going to face the revision with dread because they're going to be thinking, okay, look at me. I finished a draft. Maybe I just did NaNoWriMo. Yay me. Um, now I got to learn how to evaluate and analyze what I've done. I've got to learn how to um, fix what I've done. I've got to learn how do I take this from good to great? You know, I've got to learn all that. And maybe next time you write a book, you realize, gee, it would have been way more efficient and better if I had not done it that way. Let me find a process for doing a better job at the beginning. Um, you know, it's, it's all of those. That's why I'm not a fan of the pants, panster method of writing. Um, and look, I wrote, um, I published three novels with big five publishing houses and I was a panster my own self. So I get it. I get it. But I also uh, was a mid-list writer who did not break out of the mid-list and was not making a living at my writing. And I now know why that is so. I could have done a much better job in a lot of different ways, in some really basic ways, actually, that, that, I, that I didn't do. So that, that process of, okay, you know, how could I do better? How could I um, improve this? What can I do to, you know whatever. It's that mindset that is, that is the key to everything. And then that also takes away the fear because it's, it's like, um, Carol Dweck, who's the, you know, wrote the book, I think mindset, right. She's the big, she's the big mindset person. Um, I'm blanking on the name of her book, which is so bizarre. Um, it's such a famous book. I'll I look it up called, while you're talking about it. I think it's called it. the growth mindset. I think it's called the growth mindset. Okay. I mean, she's the one, she's the one, she's the yep. scholar, but that's but, the, name um, of it. <laughs> the growth mindset, right? It's there's oh, no, no, you were fit. right. Just mindset, just the word just mindset. mindset. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's no failure. That's what she says. There's no failure when you have a growth mindset, there's just learning and improving and okay, that happened. Now, how can I do better? You know, so approaching a revision with that um, just takes all the sting out of it because it's yeah. like, oh, wow. Hey, look what I wrote. Actually, maybe I have to throw the whole thing out, but what did I learn from it? What did it gain from it? How did I, what did I learn about my writing habits or my story or my skill level or what have you, or if you finished it and it's, um, parts of it are really good. Great. How can I fix the rest? You know that? Yeah. So yeah, mindset, everything. Uh. <laughs> I love it. This is very exciting. I actually have been thinking the last few years and asking people, you know, when I, when I think that I might be talking to someone who might know the answer, I'm like, I got to figure out like how to raise my game a level. And I actually am not sure. I know I want to write better. I know I can write better. I know I can be more imaginative, more creative. I just don't know how to do it. Now I'm like, Oh, here's a tool. This could really be <laughs> a great tool. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made it, but I like it. I like it just because it, it works, you yeah. know, I like anything that works. <laughs> so, right. Right. Whether exactly. it's mine or not. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, listen, talking about all the things that are yours, you have got um, really interesting books uh, for sale. But to really, I think what you're most known for is your teaching and editing. Um, you have the Author Accelerator program. You've got this yeah. um, shorter course, How to Revise Your Book, which is at selfpublishingformula.com. Tell us a little bit about where can people find you, the different kinds of ways that they might be interacting with you, and um, and kind of just give people some idea of like, um, these are ways that, that I or my company or things that I have done can help you. Totally. Um, yeah. So the class at self-publishing formula is a class on specifically how to revise a novel. Uh, I believe that, that they frequently have it on sale for about $200. It's, it's kind of a great, a great deal. There's examples, there's downloads, um, you get into a Facebook group. Um, so that's a great place to go if you're, um, hoping to revise something. Um, and you can learn the stoplight method and the inside outline in that class. I teach that. If you want just to get a PDF download on the inside outline, you can go to authoraccelerator.com backslash inside outline book. And there is right on that page, there's a download. I don't think you have to do anything. I think you can just download it. Um, there is a sign up there because I am writing a book on the inside outline. Oh, um, nice. I just have to finish it. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> wow. I think the entire audience totally gets what you're talking about, Jenny. <laughs> um, and, and what's interesting about that is I have really, uh, just like most people, I have gotten very close to the end. I've done the thing that I'm talking about, like, oh, I think this is stupid. I hate it. Nobody cares that whole thing. And probably the way I'm going to get over that hump is I will probably be hiring a book coach, my own self. Um, even though I am the, the teacher of book coaches, but that, that leads me to, um, if people are interested in hiring a book coach at authoraccelerator.com, we have a free matching service where we will match you with one of our certified coaches, um, at no cost. And we have a person who does that. And she looks at you do an intake form where you tell us about where you are with your work, what you're looking for, your topic, your genre, and Diana will match you with one of our coaches. Um, and there's no obligation. You can talk to them, see if it's a good fit. Um, we, we have that service. And if you are thinking, gosh, being a book coach sounds like the dream. I get to help writers and work with stories and be my own boss. We, that's the core of what Author Accelerator does is we have a training and certification program for book coaches. And you can, I have a six part video series where I talk all about book coaching and what it is and who might be good at it. And can you make money even in a pandemic? The answer is yes, it's been, it's been actually quite great for book coaches. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I hate to say that, but it's true. Um, and you can find those videos at bookcoaches.com backslash ABC. That's ABC. It's about book coaching, but it's oh. bookcoaches.com backslash ABC. Um, those videos are, are there and they're free and they're 30 minutes each. So you'll spend a lot of time with me. <laughs> good, <laughs> you might good. get tired of me, but, um, <laughs> but that's it. And um, I don't know that I have a download on the stoplight method, but I feel like I must because it's in so many of my classes. So let me, let me find one and we'll put that in your show notes too. Excellent. All right. That sounds good. And if not, you just thought of a whole new thing that you can use as your lead magnet for other areas. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Stop giving me ideas of things that are good ideas. <laughs> I know what you mean. I no need more like, ideas. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I really think that Mickey Mouse uh, had the right idea when he was the Sorcerer's Apprentice, when he was like, I just need another mini me. But then you're like, okay, I have to remember. Mickey Mouse showed me that this is not going to work. <laughs> Wait, can't... you're kind of blowing my mind right now. The Mickey Mouse in the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Do was... I have the wrong? No, the I, I think you do. But was it was created by the Sorcerer? Um. So okay, it's been a little while since I've seen it. But uh, his job was to sweep the floor, but he didn't yeah. want to, or he had too much to do, or whatever. And so he used a spell to make two brooms, right? Oh, uh, and then there was four brooms and then there was a hundred brooms or something like that. 
Yeah, but I, I thought that it came, it sprung from within the apprentice, like I can use all the power. Oh, see, Not, now we're going to have to go back and watch it again. <laughs> no, I mean, it's kind of blowing my mind because I, I, that would be a really different, different story than I think it was. I'm going to have yeah. to go look at that. <laughs> you know, and, and here's what happens. I assume that it happens with everyone. And then literally I was talking to a friend of mine, it had to have been 10 years ago. And I said, you know how you're like driving or just sitting on the couch or something. And then like the story starts going through your head and it just starts growing and you've got this bigger and bigger story. And she's like, no. <laughs> and I was like, I don't understand. All people don't have this. <laughs> But one of these other things that I do is I take a story that I sort of half remember, and then I create a whole brand new story out of it in my mind. And then people are like, that's not how the story goes. I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I, do, I do something like that, but it's worse. I do it in my own life. I make up these whole stories about what happened to one of my kids because they didn't text me back. Like it's just whole drama where they've been abducted and, yeah. you know, whatever. And, and my poor husband will just be like, um... Yeah, no, that's not what the real world is like. <laughs> you know? But if you read Dean R. Kuhn's books in like the 80s and 90s, you will, like me, have an absolute, almost terrifying aversion to white Ford panel vans. Oh. They kidnap so many people. A hundred percent. I was walking by a house the other day and there were three parked in a row. And, and I was like, oh, it's a kidnapper house. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> totally. I, I, I used to write down, I used to write down license plate numbers just in case I heard about that on the news. <laughs> we would totally be friends if we lived in the same place. <laughs> I like it. Sometime we'll have to make it happen. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, this has been great fun. Now, if people have all the addresses, right? So selfpublishingformula.com has the shorter course and then authoraccelerator.com can give you information about getting a book coach. Or if you think you might be interested in being a book coach, you can go to bookcoaches.com. And then uh, what's it? Jennynash.com. That was also one of the things in your bio. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, I never say that one. <laughs> Oh, um, maybe, I maybe. Never, <laughs> no, I never say that one because um, that is my own personal coaching site. I do still do one on one coaching, but I, I coach exclusively nonfiction book proposals. Oh, um, nice. And I um, take very, very few people. I, I book out, I mean, I book out six or more months in advance. So yeah. I tend not to send people there because they get don't frustrated. Go there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You but, don't want to um, go there, <laughs> but, but maybe, you, maybe we should have you on the show again, uh, after the new year to talk about nonfiction. Cause I don't get enough people talking about nonfiction to the people who are writing nonfiction and listening to the show. Oh yeah. I could talk for days. Um, <laughs> it also touches on memoir, which a lot of people write. And yeah. I have, I have a lot of thoughts um, about that, but, the, um, yes, people can absolutely go to jennynash.com. I also have <laughs> on there, um, there's top 10 tips for writing a book and it goes through 10 steps and every step has a free or very low priced offer for how to learn that thing. Oh, so wow. um, it's kind of just all of my thoughts in one place. So there is that there um, <laughs> that, that, but yes, I'd be happy to come back. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much. Um, the audience maybe uh, hasn't, hasn't figured out that you and I have taken a few days to make this work. So I appreciate all the time that you put into the episode today. We'll make of sure course. that people have all of the, um, all of the links in the show notes. Thank you so much. It's been super fun and crazy helpful. I'm so glad. Thank you for having me. And I just want to remind everybody not to be afraid of revision. It's an awesome process. It can be a powerful time in your writing and there are ways to do it really well. <laughs>